somewhere during the the heaven and hell period, you were asked by Carrie Livgren from Kansas mm -hmm. to perform, sing mm -hmm. two songs on an album he's doing called Seeds of Change. Right. One song is called The Mask of the Great Deceiver, and the other one is called To Live for the King. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, first of all, how that happened, and then what, what did you think of the lyrics of the songs? Well, I was, I was asked by... Um uh, by a Bud Carr's office. I don't know if you know Bud. Bud was managing Kerry and managed Kansas, as it happened before that. And so Bud's office had called called Wendy and said, you know, uh, Kerry would like to have uh, Ronnie sing on one of the songs that, that he's written, that he wrote for him. Kerry had been at uh, Kansas City Chiefs Stadium uh, when, in Elf, we opened for Deep Purple. Um, it was, let's see, Purple were the headline. It was Purple. It was... Uh, Jay Giles band. Uh, it was um, a band called Navasoto, uh, and it was one other one. Was it ZZ Top? Somebody like that. Anyway, um, we played Kansas City Chiefs Stadium. Kerry was in the crowd. He saw the Elf show and went, someday I'm going to do something with him. I like, he's a really good singer. And all those years later, Kerry had his success. He said, see if he can get Ronnie James Deal. Well, Ronnie James Deal was now in Black Sabbath. And Kerry Livgren is now born again Christian. Who used to be one, you know, one of the most black magic guys on the face of the planet. Really? Kerry, oh yeah, Kerry was. A, he put the rest of us away. He made Satan look pretty tame. I think Kerry did. Um, wow. But he had a real, you know, frightening out of life black magic experience on the telephone with his wife, uh, which just changed him all around. So he became a born again Christian. Uh, I was asked to do this, and uh, I, I heard uh, one of the songs, which was "Mask of the Great Deceiver." I had not heard "To Live for the King." And I love the song. I thought, well, that's great. Yeah, okay, I'll do it. So I had just come back from England. I was on my way from England. We had just finished the mix of Heaven and Hell. Um, so I came into the picture saying not only Mask of the Great Deceiver, but Live with the King. Uh, thought the lyrics were, you know, I thought the lyrics told their own story. I had no idea what it was. Didn't know he was a born-again Christian. Had no idea that they were relig religious lyrics. Just looked, him and looked at, them, at them and made my own determination and sang them the way I felt them. And he said, that's, that's it. You did it. That's the way I wanted it. I, okay, thank you. And then we talked at length, you know, about his leanings toward his new uh, uh, Christianity. And he never tried to change my views of anything like that. He's just a great person. Uh, and so it was done before Sabbath. But you will notice on the album there is no, there is mention of so and so Paul Hammond from Atlanta Rhythm Section and um, uh, David Page from Ambrosia and Ronnie James Dio, not from Black Sabbath. Uh, I think that was probably too much of a reach for him from that that point uh, to have it put down that Black Sabbath took part of it in a Christian feeling that he had. But he's a great person. I love him to death. What a talented man. Great song. It's it's funny because um, they re-released that. They remastered they it should. and re-released it uh, a, f a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's an interview, and he's actually very proud of the fact that you were in Black Sabbath. Well, he, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah now. <laughs> it's funny how things yeah. change. So, yeah. Ronnie James Dio, he doesn't seem like a likely candidate to be on the album, but uh, did you know him from a previous... No, I didn't know Ronnie at all. Uh, you know, it's funny, this is probably the most, uh, of all the interviews I do and all the questions that are asked, I get asked this question more than anything else. What about Ronnie James Dio? For some reason, people think it's just incredibly controversial, and I suppose it is in some ways. Uh, part of the reason that I wanted to make the Seeds to Change album at the time that I wanted to make it was uh, uh, I had recently become a Christian, and I felt a great compulsion to uh, to do an album of music that uh, expressed you know the things that I had discovered. Uh, if, you, if you look at the history of my lyrics on the Kansas albums, they're uh, a long history on uh, spiritual subjects, and it's kind of a uh, the chronicles of uh, my personal spiritual pilgrimage, and that pilgrimage came to a conclusion. So I was extremely motivated to. I didn't want to do a quote gospel album or a Christian album in the usual sense. It was more like an album by a Christian. And Ronnie James Dio at that time had just become the lead singer for Black Sabbath. Dun dun dun. dun and suspense. <laughs> Suspense builds. It, of all the people I could have chosen, uh, most Christians then and now raise eyebrows at that. Well, my answer is uh, twofold. One is that 
uh, one of my criteria for making the album is that I wanted to use absolutely the most hand-picked, best musicians for each song that I could find. And the song Mask of the Great Deceiver and To Live for the King, uh, I had heard Ronnie sing with uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Before that, he was with a band, I think they were called Elf, and I had heard him sing there, and I had always been extremely impressed with his vocal abilities. And when I visualized those songs in my head and visualized him singing them, it, everything about it was right. Now, I said the answer is twofold, so musically, he was the right guy for the job. Spiritually is another side of it. And to me, uh, the irony of it was just irresistible <laughs> that I could take the, uh, the lead singer for Black Sabbath, have him sing on a Christian album, and for once have him sing the truth about who Satan is. I just thought, the, 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 like I said, the irony was just irresistible. I, I couldn't help but do that. So I felt like it was the best for the audience. It was the best messenger to deliver that message. And the message itself... I thought it would be very interesting to have it work on the singer himself, which it did. Some uh, rather interesting things took place in the studio while we were recording. Well, did Ronnie know what kind of a project he was getting involved in? No, no. We called him up, and uh, I think our manager said, uh, uh, the guitar player for Kansas is doing a solo album, and uh, he'd like you to sing on it. And you know, I didn't have to, at the time, twist anybody's arm. Uh, they, they were all very eager to... Uh, I think both on an artistic level and, and the fact that they were being paid, <laughs> that always helps. So uh, yeah. he flew over from England and uh, picked him up at the airport, and that was the first time I ever met him. We got to know each other, <clears throat> and, and uh, all the guys that worked on the album lived in my house for a while, so we all got to know each other you know, pretty well, and we remain, remain friends. The 